Welcome to Worship Cafe. 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 I'm David Sheeler. I'm the pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Dunedin. And thank you for welcoming me and George Natal and our worship band, along with Mr. Eric, into your home or wherever you may be as we worship together today. I invite you as we do worship together to participate fully, to sing with us, to pray with us, to listen with us, but to fully engage as we worship God together. Well, let us prepare our hearts and minds and do just that. Let's worship and praise God today. never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of a nation savior he can move the mountains my god is my Please pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, we get into routines. We like our routines, even in the midst of the, the craziness that seems to be much of our world this day. We still have gotten into routines, some regular patterns of the way we live our days, creating a, a, a new normal, perhaps. And yet, loving God, even in the midst of our routines and our regular daily expectations, you surprise us, maybe with a little 
glance out of the corner of our eyes, you give us a new perspective, a twist of our head, and suddenly we see things we never saw before. So we pray, gracious God, that in the midst of our regular routines and the regular patterns of our lives and all that we can count on and depend on, that you will still find a way to surprise us, that your spirit will move in and among and through us this day. And the things that we're hearing and reading and singing together, praying together, that your voice will come. A new shift in our vision will appear and we will see things in a whole new way, in a whole new light the light of your kingdom, the light of your kingdom of love and grace, justice, healing, and hope. And we pray this in the name of the King of your kingdom, your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Georgian band, uh, thank you, as always. And I know that Mr. Eric is with us for a little time with our children. So, Mr. Eric? Well, hello, everyone. It's Mr. Eric again, and we're still in the Bible story realm of the Old Testament. You might remember that last week, Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. He and his people camped at the base of the Holy Mountain, and Moses was called up to the top of the mountain to meet with God and receive these two tablets that contain the Ten Commandments. You remember Moses? And there's God's commandments on the tablets. Well, 
Moses is gone a long time. He's up there for 40 days and 40 nights, and the people do some stupid things while he's gone. They get nervous. They don't think he's coming back. And they decide they're going to create their own god to worship. They take all their earrings, melt the gold down, and make a calf, a cow, out of gold, and start worshiping it and calling it God and dancing around it. How foolish. It'd be like me worshiping my stuffed animal. That's what they're doing when Moses starts to come down the mountain. Well, here we go. Here's Moses coming down, and he's hearing this commotion down there. They're running around, worshiping and singing and yelling to this calf. Do you think he's going to be happy? I don't think so. So Moses is angry. Do you see him? He throws down the tablets of the Ten Commandments. They break because the people are dancing around this silly golden calf. Let's take a look at some more representations here. Here's another picture of what the golden calf might have looked like. And look at the people thinking that's their God. Moses is unhappy, of course. Again, here's another picture of him throwing the tablets down in front of the golden calf. He takes the calf and he puts it in the fire. Can you see below part of the calf is melting in the fire? It turns to powder eventually. He throws the powder on the water and makes everybody drink it. They drink the calf, what they called their god. Well, a foolish, foolish thing for them to do. And here's a few, a cute song that makes fun of a calf as a god. A cow. Yeah, golden cap. Yo, golden cap, you are so great. You make us want to celebrate. You brought us out of Egypt land. Yo, golden cap, you are the man with golden horns and golden udders. Golden cap, there is no other. Golden cap, you make us sing. We made you out of our earring. Golden cap, oh, we are oh, wow. You are a god. You are a cow. Moo. Moo. That's all that God could do was moo. And we know better than that not to worship something that's not really God, something not like this. So that's our lesson today. There's only one true God. Moses reminds the people of that. And come back next week and we'll look at the next episode of this exciting story of Moses and his people. I want to say hi to Seamus and Eloise and Van and Merrick and Nolan and all my friends. This is Mr. Eric saying goodbye for now. Bye. Thanks, Mr. Eric. Our scripture reading today comes again from Matthew's Gospel. We're continuing right along. We've picked up now in the 22nd chapter. Jesus continues to teach uh, the crowds that are around him, uh, not just his disciples, but also the general crowds and including uh, many of the uh, religious professionals, the chief priests and scribes and Pharisees. For Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem. This is the last week of his life and ministry there in Jerusalem before his betrayal and crucifixion, death and resurrection. So as you might imagine, the tension is rising in his relationship, Jesus's relationship with the authorities. But we're going to read, as I said, Matthew chapter 22. We'll read the first 14 verses together. Now once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. Well, the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed these, those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, Look, the wedding is ready, but those who invi were invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Well, those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they had found, both good and bad. 
so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Please pray with me. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, they often say with children, it's some of the simplest toys that are the best toys. I can remember that when I was a child for one of my favorite toys was a simple kaleidoscope. Now, I know a lot of kaleidoscopes can be real works of art, but trust me, mine was not. It was just a simple cardboard tube uh, with one end that had clear plastic. And behind that clear plastic was a, a set of, of colored uh, bits of plastic itself uh, that just shook around in the bottom of the tube. On the other end of the cardboard tube was a, a hole that you could peek through. And inside the tube were a, a series of mirrors, all at different angles, so that when you looked through the, the, the viewfinder end, you could see all the pretty designs that the bits of plastic made and the light coming through and the mirrors reflecting off of it. And I would spend hours upon hours looking at through the viewfinder and looking at all the, the different patterns that the plastic bits would, would make. Beautiful, beautiful patterns. But what always struck me about that kaleidoscope, of course, is that you could look at a pattern, beautiful as it was, but then turn it slightly, and suddenly all the little pieces of colored plastic would shift, change position, and there would be a whole new pattern that would be created. I wonder sometimes if Scripture isn't a bit that way, or at least it should be. I mean, we look at Scripture and we assume that the way that we are looking at it is the way that we're supposed to look at it, or at least there's one right way to look at it. But then we can turn it slightly, just ever so gently in a different direction, and suddenly a whole new pattern begins to develop. I remember a number of years ago hearing a Jewish rabbi comment to uh, some Protestant Christian pastors how it struck him as odd that it seemed to be in Christian seminaries, and I'll say certainly seemed to be true for, for mine for the most part, that we would spend hour upon hour, day after day, year after year, studying the scriptures, digging into the historical context, the literary context, wondering about who had written what and when and, and what their points were, also who had edited the final version and what agendas that they may have had, so that we could all put all of these pieces together to interpret and to create the one right interpretation of the scripture. As I said, this Jewish rabbi was baffled by that, for he commented that in rabbinical school, why his professors would fail him if he didn't come up with at least three different ways to interpret a particular scripture. See, he and his rabbinical professors seem to understand that scripture is rich and full of meaning. And like that kaleidoscope, you might get fixated on one particular pattern. But take a piece of scripture, take a story and shift it, turn it just slightly. And suddenly you can see a whole different pattern emerge. Art is like that. And certainly stories are art. Scripture can be a form of art at times. Because the writer, the creator of the art, may have an intention. But those who receive it, while well, they may read and receive different things, different people seeing different things in art. Uh, Pablo Picasso might create a very strange and, and abstract scene that he had particular intention. But then you and I look at it and we begin to gather and garner different things out of exactly the same image. I wonder, perhaps, if Scripture isn't the same way. And it makes sense, after all, because Scripture, and particularly the stories that we read, and certainly the parables that Jesus told, his own works of art, well, they're words to describe God. And the one thing that we know about the words to describe God 
is that they, in fact, aren't actually God. In fact, they can't fully encapsulate God. For God is beyond our language. God is beyond our human understanding. So we may begin to use some words, or in Jesus' case, a parable, a story to describe God. But if it's rich enough, full enough, turn it just a little bit. And maybe you can start seeing some different things. After all, language, as I said, is a, a, a metaphor, a simile, a figure of speech for God. And oftentimes when we use a metaphor, a simile, a figure of speech, even those can begin to break down after a while. The poet might have said, my love is a red, red rose, but did he mean that it's full of thorns and takes a lot of manure in order to grow properly? Even the language, the metaphors and similes we use begin to break down after a while. I've been thinking about all of these things as I read this particular parable this week. I mean, you heard it as I read it just a, a moment ago. Jesus tells the parable a story of, of a king, uh, of a king who, who has a, throws a great wedding banquet for his son. And he invites all of his friends, all the big and important people of the kingdom to, to come and to, to prepare and to be ready and to celebrate this great wedding banquet that he has, has put together. Well, they refuse the invitation at first, so the king sends out his slaves again to, to make sure to, to reiterate the, uh, the invitation. And, and some of those invited are so incensed at the invitation to the king's son's wedding banquet that they actually take the slaves and, and mistreat them, abuse them, and eventually kill them. Well, furious, the, the king then decides to, to go out and destroy their city. And, and while he's doing that, he instructs his slaves to then uh, take and go out and find anybody that they can. Go out into the streets, pull in the both good and the bad. Uh, nobody of, of account or, or anybody that they can find. And just make sure that the hall is full when it comes time to, to celebrate. Strangely enough, once the hall is full of people, the king comes in and is furious when amongst the throngs of people that have assembled all at the last minute, he finds one poor homeless guy who doesn't seem to be dressed appropriately for the occasion. And he, he lambasts him for not having on the proper attire. Speechless, the, the man has no response. But the king takes him and throws him out of the banquet hall into the outer darkness as Jesus says, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, this is obviously quite a, a dark parable. And perhaps it has some important points to make. Certainly it does. Perhaps there are the same points that I have long assumed were the points of this parable. Because uh, I've preached on this parable countless times in my years of ministry. And I've tended to pull out of it the same pattern of meaning that I always have that we ought to take God's invitation seriously. That God's invitation, of course, ultimately is to a, a, a party, a, a banquet, but it is an invitation to be taken seriously. It will not be trifled with, delay or reject, and God will go out and find somebody else to invite. In fact, as it turns out, God has invited those uh, not who deserve to be there, not somehow who've earned their place. But out of sheer graciousness, God has called just all sorts of people, even the likes of you and me, to come to the wedding banquet. But even then, there's a, a word of judgment and caution to be ready, to be prepared, even if we are here by God's sheer grace. That's sort of the story that I've often heard when I've read this parable. But again, I wonder if, I, if I'm looking at it and assuming that 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 pattern, that way of understanding it is fixed. What if we took that same parable and just turned it a little bit like my, like my kaleidoscope, let the pieces shift slightly and see if there isn't a whole different pattern that we can see here. Because after all, this does seem to be a rather brutal parable. And I've even heard it allegorized in ways that become even more disturbing. It's easy to do. The king becomes God. The king's son, of course, Jesus. The, the slaves who were rejected, the prophets of the Old Testament who were rejected and killed. 
But then, of course, the, those of us who were followers of Jesus get invited at the last minute for no other reason than just sheer grace. And so we're glad to be there, but also careful as well. Seen in this way, I, I even wonder more about the parable. Certainly, it's been used in kind of an anti-Semitic way, rejecting uh, Jews who have rejected Jesus. Wonder also, too, about the God who coerces people into the party. It may be a party, but maybe you're there by force, afraid of what the king will do if you don't join the party. What kind of image of God is that? Again, maybe if we turn it a little bit slightly, we'll, we'll see something different. Because did you note at the beginning of the way he, Jesus tells this parable, what he specifically he says? You see, he doesn't say the kingdom of God is like a king. He says instead that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who throws a great wedding banquet for his son. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to this sort of king. Maybe, as we've often assumed, that comparison is positive. But what if it's negative? What if this king that Jesus is talking about in the parable is in fact not God at all, but, but instead like all the other kings that we have known throughout our time and throughout our history, kings that have ruled by intimidation and oppression, kings that have brought violence and fear to, to people. What if God's kingdom, what if the kingdom of heaven is being negatively compared to those kinds of kings? That the king of love and grace, of healing and hope, is being compared to be different from this kind of oppressive and violent king. Sure, he's throwing a party, but we know that not all parties are, are to uh, be accepted, are the invitations to be accepted. Remember back in Exodus, there's the story of the people of Israel. Uh, they get a little antsy because Moses has gone off on Mount Sinai to listen to God and receive the Ten Commandments. So while they're shifting in their seats and getting anxious, they decide to take all their gold from their earrings and rings and, and melt it together and make a golden calf and to throw a big party and to worship this image that they have made with their own hands, their best achievement. That's not the sort of party we're supposed to accept an invitation to. Or you may remember the story that's told in the Old Testament book of Daniel about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and about how they were in exile in Babylon, and how the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar wanted to throw a big party and how he too had, had made this, this image that was to represent all the, the power of, of him and the, the, the state of, of Babylon. And how when the music played, people were supposed to respond in, in allegiance to this image of the king and state and to pay their proper patriotic homage to it. Except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, being good uh, Israelites, good Jews, uh, they did not. They refused, for they would not worship this other God, this God of state and government and king. No, they refused, and the, the king threatened them with the power of the fiery furnace, which, they, of course, as you know the story, they ended up surviving because of God's grace for them. But again, we're not to follow, not to join in on King Nebuchadnezzar's party. So maybe it's the same thing with this party. Maybe instead of Jesus being the, the son who's receiving the wedding banquet, what if we turn this a little bit and, and Jesus is actually the, that poor man there who isn't properly dressed, who refuses to join in on the party, who will not fall prey to, to being coerced and conjoled and forced into to some sort of state-sanctioned celebration but instead goes his own way, shows his own independence, and refuses to worship a false god, to join into a, a false party, but instead to wait for the summation of all things, for the new heaven and the new earth, even if it means his own detriment, his own suffering, his own wailing and gnashing of teeth, his own time in the darkness. 
turn that parable suddenly just a, a little bit differently, we get a different perspective. We see a different way and we recognize a different God, a different king, a king of love and grace and justice, a, a king of healing and hope, a king that causes us and calls us to refuse the false stories, the false celebrations, so that we can celebrate with the one who gives true life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, help us. Help us to see things a little bit differently, to have a little bit different perspective. For we remember the words of, uh, of the New Testament say how you have taken what everybody assumes uh, to be strong in this world, what we think we all know uh, to show signs of strength and power, and instead to use what is weak, what it's seems to be shameful, to in fact shame those who think they are so strong, or to, or to take the things that we sure account for nothing, that are of no consequence or importance, and instead to use those to shame those who think they have it all together. Or even how you took a, a, a simple stone, one that had been ignored and cast aside and stumbled over, and instead used it as a cornerstone to build a whole new world, a whole new kingdom, the kingdom of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. O oh God, 
Help us to see a little bit differently. Help us to see your purpose, your healing and hope. Help us to take the the world's narrative of, of brokenness, of pain, and turn to see a different way of healing and hope. May we take a, a look at the world that, that, has a, that declares different truths of power and violence, of selfishness and self-serving, to turn and see just slightly differently your kingdom of service and care. May we look upon your world where we think we know that there is no hope, that we can have no impact, and instead see a different vision where we are called to be a part of your coming kingdom, that even despite what we think is all evidence to the contrary, to see you at work, bringing healing and reconciliation, peace and justice. Holy God, help us to see and hear differently. Help us to live differently. To live not according to the rules of of this world, to the stories and and calls and claims of, of this existence, but instead to see your kingdom and today, right now, to live as a part of it. For you have shown us, O Lord, you've shown us in the one who was rejected, but became the chief, the corner, the king and Lord of heaven and earth, your son and our savior, Jesus. And so we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we prepare to say goodbye for another week, I do want to offer a few words of invitation. First, as always, if you're new or relatively new to First Church, I invite you to get to know more about our ministry and mission and life together. You can do that primarily by going to our website, which is www.fpcduneden.org. Again, that's fpcduneden.org. You can even scroll down the homepage and click to subscribe to our regular email news updates. I also certainly want to invite you to support our ongoing ministry and mission financially. You can do that, of course, by sending checks to the church at 455 Scotland Street, giving through your bank's own online uh, service, or going again to our website, fpcdeneden.org, and clicking on the Donate Now button. And finally, later on this morning, we have a time of fellowship just getting together with our online brunch. That happens from 1145 until 1215. So I invite you to be a part of that, meet some friends, uh, see some old ones. Uh, It's done via Zoom, and that Zoom link ought to be showing up in the comments section of this video uh, right about now. It's also, of course, in the weekly uh, e-news update as well. Well, again, time to say goodbye. As we head off for another week, all that will hold for us there, uh, let's say our charge together. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor and respect everyone. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen.